Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I can see uh, a couple of people have logged on so far. Hopefully we'll have some more join us very soon. My name's Bronwyn Edwards. Uh, I'm from Roses in the Ocean. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you, Carrie. Hi, everyone, I'm Carrie. Um, I'm one of the facilitators of this co-design process across New South Wales, all of the alternatives to ED services. Um, so doing this facilitation with Roses. And also Will. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, William Stubbs. I'm one of the facilitators on the project uh, with the experience of society myself uh, and experience in design. So really excited to see this project um, get through to this uh, very near final stage. Lovely. All right. Well, look, thank you so much for joining us for this uh, feedback loop. It is the final one for this particular co-design process. So I'm just going to share my screen now and Carrie and Will and myself will walk you through um, everything we've, we've got to so far and what happened in the, the last session. Uh, and then there'll be some time for some questions and answers at the end. So just bear with me for one moment while I share my screen here. All right. Get that up. Okay. Carrie and Will, does that, is that viewing well for you? Looks great. Great, all right then. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to just take the time to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which um, you're all meeting. So uh, for the Nepean Blue Mountains, of course, it's the Darug, the Gundungara and the Wiradjuri people. And we pay our respects to the elders past, present and future. Uh, for myself, I'm here in Brisbane and um, so I pay my respects to the, to the Torrible people. I'd also like to acknowledge people with a lived experience of suicide, uh, many of whom have been involved in this co-design process. Uh, and, you know, of course, this is why we do what we do. Um, this alternative to ED is all about providing an alternative space for people to um, find the support that they're looking for. So thank you to everyone um, who brings that lived experience to the table. And of course, to all our health professionals, many of whom have a lived experience of suicide as well, um, and others who are absolutely impacted by suicide through their work. So just to give you a bit of an orientation of where we're at, uh, we have been through um, a full process now. We've had um, focused conversations both with lived experience people and health professionals. The lived experience group have come together for a group session. We've had a couple of uh, feedback loops. The health professionals have come together for a session. And then we've had a uh, another combined session uh, very recently where we had health professionals and people with lived experience um, in together, working together. So we are here uh, now at the final feedback loop. And uh, the purpose of today's session is to give you that um, overview of what's been done so far. And it's an opportunity for us to uh, go back out to community with a survey that, that will link to this uh, live webinar recording so that we've just got that last opportunity in this particular phase of co-design for feedback from, from the broader community and to gather final suggestions to inform that service model. I mean, obviously um, co-design is an iterative process, so there will be ongoing um, design and redesign, of course. So, but this is coming to the end of the initial co-design phase. So, just to give you a brief overview from the feedback, findings from feedback loop number two, we had 20 lived experience people and 23 health professionals uh, respond to that survey, which was a fantastic engagement from community. The overall, um, the perspectives and thoughts or suggestions that were provided through that survey focused on, on, on these uh, areas. People looking at uh, and, and wondering about, concerned about limited capacity and availability that's going to be possible through the actual um, available funds. The location and making sure that it was chosen in the right spot within your region. Um, looking at how community outreach or follow up, what would that mean for the alternative to ED safe space? Uh, focusing in on staffing model, what the actual safe space physically looks like, feels like. Uh, what would the model of support be? How would it be promoted in the community? Uh, how would uh, staff and guests feel safe in this, in this space? 
the practicalities of a wrong door of, of a no wrong door principle. So obviously part of the statewide requirements are that the, the service is to be a no wrong door. What are the practical implications of that and how do you honour that in line with your values and principles of the service? What would the governance structures be? And just that need for more discussion on key aspects of the model. So they were the types of things that people brought to that feedback loop to survey. So what has been agreed so far, um, what you're about to see is what we know so far from lived experience and health professional focus groups, co-design sessions with lived experience people and health professionals in their own groups, and also a combined session and feedback loops one and two. So the safe space elements that uh, we have focused on are there on screen now the values of the space, the location, the connection pathways, in and out, staffing, workforce development, the service model, the physical environment and accessibility, and governance. The values to inform the model, you've got there on the left-hand side in the blue box are the values that were uh, established through the co-design that Ministry of Health led towards the end of last year with a, about 100 people in the room. Be aware of that. I think you've all seen this in various um, sessions. And then the values for the Nepean Blue Mountain Safe Space, uh, as they stand at the moment, are uh, there on screen. So inclusive, non judgmental, safety, confidentiality, hope, empathy, respect, kindness, authenticity, and compassion. Values and principles take time. So this is something that, as a community and as a, as a group of people who've been involved in this process, you're you will need to continue to refine these and think about these as the service model um, translates into service delivery. So uh, this is a model I'm just about to hand over to Will in a moment. Um, this is our traffic light system. This is going to show you uh, anything that's in green. There's really lovely alignment between the Ministry of Health statewide requirements, the people with lived experience of suicide that have been involved in the process and health professionals that have been involved in the process. Anything in orange just indicates that there's still some areas for discussion um, that needing to explore a bit further. And anything in red text simply means that it's out of scope according to the New South Wales Ministry of Health requirements. So uh, Will, I'll hand over to you and you just let me know every time you need me to move on. Sure. Thanks, Bron. Um, look, one broad thing to say about all this is um, there's a lot of work that's been put into this by the group um, to ensure that we can come up with ideas and get a consensus on that. And that's really, really difficult a lot of the time, um, particularly when there is so much potential and so much that we could be doing. Um, but I'm really, really pleased as the process has gone on, we've been able to reach a lot of green on this slide. So you will see a, mostly everything is green, which essentially means that we have an agreement, we have a consensus about these ideas, and that's fantastic. There are some scattering of orange and red, um, but that is very few, um, which is, again, really brilliant to see at this point of the project. Um, so I won't go through every single thing that's on there because there is a lot, um, but there is the recording of this webinar, and I believe also this content um, is also in this survey as well. Um, so you will have access to this if you want to read through it in detail. I, I do encourage that if you have the time. Um, so location of the safe space. Location, location, location. It's always really, really important. Um, and not just where that's going to be, but also what are the contexts around that for, say, getting to that space, public transport, um, or general accessibility. Um, one thing that came up, say, in the location of safe space for Nepean Blue Mountains was exactly where is that going to be between the three, three different regions. So Hawkesbury Mountains and Lithgow all need services. Where are we going to position this initial safe space um, to make sure we can service as many people as possible, bearing in mind that at present we don't have the resources to have more than one safe space. So that's one thing we need to explore in the future about exactly where this is going to be situated. Uh, next slide. Uh, Perfect. Um, then connections pathways to safe spaces. Again, lots of green, a couple of red here. Um, one of those, for instance, is that uh, dedicated roles to promote new services and build relationships. And I think that's a really, really good point. Um, but if you do have a safe space in the region, it is going to be particularly effective if you have those relationships and those referral uh, points to other communities in, in the, uh, the area, other services. However, because of the restrictions and the resources that we have, we may not be able to have dedicated roles to promote the new services and build relationships right now. That may come in the future, depending upon resources, um, but we may also be looking at what are the roles within the space and how can they support that uh, endeavor as well. But having dedicated roles 
is out of scope at this stage. Um, there was also the suggestion of the ability to transport guests as part of the service. Again, that's possible, so that's an orange, but exactly how that would work is still to be determined. So that's one thing, and the other two oranges there, um, we are particularly looking for feedback on. So then outward connections and partnerships. Again, as I mentioned before, really, really important, I think, in a safe space. Um, the follow-up via home visit, again, because of resources, potentially is going to be out of scope, um, whereas a follow-up in a week or two via a phone call can be really, really impactful. How are we going to achieve that with the resources that we have, bearing in mind two full-time uh, equivalent roles, is something to be determined. Overall, though, a lot of green there and, and not a lot of um, uh, difference. One um, red that is there that's probably worth mentioning is the ability to stay for a night so in respite. Um, because of the uh, staffing provisions as well as some things around the facilities, that may not be possible. Um, so that one is in red. Um, but again, feedback across all these would be really beneficial to figure out exactly how we do manage that. And the next one. Yeah, please, um, Will, just while I'm going to the next slide, I'll just mention also in terms of that follow-up, a home visit, that is where that really good integration with the suicide prevention outreach teams mm. will be really important because hopefully the safe space and the suicide prevention outreach team can work together and that spot team will be able to, um, to fill in that gap. That's a really good example of why that one's in orange too, um, in that that's potentially possible, exactly how we facilitate though, that is, is to be figured out and using additional services like that could clinch the deal. Uh, staffing. Um, probably one of the most important aspects of the safe space. So a bit more red and orange in here, as expected. Staffing across all the LHDs that I've worked in so far is a really tricky one. Um, there's so much that we do need, but there is um, some limitations of what we have available in the first iteration of the safe space. Um, so a couple of things here, um, clinicians working alongside peer workers. Now, because of the, of the um, guidance around the safe space, it is peer-led, it's peer experience-led. Having clinician support, definitely possible, but clinicians working alongside peer workers isn't quite within the scope of the safe space. Um, having volunteers to increase capacity, though, on a different note, that's there in orange, definitely a potential, um, but exactly how those volunteers will be interfacing, what training they have, how many of them, all that is to be um, decided upon. Whereas some really great points in here about trained peer workers have been agreed upon and staff comfortable sharing lived experience. So some really, really good agreements, um, some things to figure out though in the red and the orange. Workforce element support, all green which is happy days. Um, some really good points in here about support, um, about say team leader play a role of professional support, which I've seen consistently across these safe spaces, a really big emphasis on making sure that skills and knowledge is constantly developed and supported, which I think is absolutely crucial, um, as well as the relationships between peer workers and other health professionals. Again, to have that support network around it is absolutely vital. So for the service model, um, there was a couple of things in here that I found particularly interesting myself uh, in orange, the digital safe space. Again, that's absolutely potential, um, but again, that requires resources. And so what will that digital safe space accomplish? What platforms, how are we gonna be uh, supporting that, maintaining that, but some sort of outreach there or some sort of tools that are digital is potentially really, really useful. Um, the community outreach crisis support or the SPOT uh, is in red. It's not essentially part of this framework, but it could be tapped into, as Robin mentioned, for other services as required. Um, but we will need to figure out exactly how that does work for this particular safe space, at least in the first iteration. Otherwise, though, lots of green, lots of agreement, and some really, really fantastic ideas there as well. Physical environment and accessibility, which is one of my favorite aspects of this. I think it has a really, really big impact on exactly the experience of being in that safe space. So some really fantastic ideas that came out, including outdoor areas, um, the computer access, and ideally twilight hours, making sure that we have the ability of after hour services. But one thing that did come up is that a static site unlikely to be successful. And that was an interesting point, um, but if you do have this region, how do you service different spaces, different needs, if you're having it in one space? And I'm sure we can um, overcome that challenge and that consideration. It may be different sort of um, programs to we can get in front of the other people around the region, but having that static site was one concern about is this going to be accessible for everybody across the Nathan Blue Mountains region? Um, so feedback on that one of the survey, I, I would love to see some notes on that one. 
governance, um, sometimes a little boring, but really, really crucial. Um, and a lot of green here, which is really good to see. Uh, people generally have the same idea about how we're going to be operating this from a governance perspective. Um, a couple of orange though to, to uh, pick up on though is um, the engagement of staff with experience and other LHDs, consultants and experts, which has a lot of potential, I think, to share information, share resources and knowledge. Um, but how we do that is uh, still to be determined. And my computer is having a little bit of a glitch. Sorry about that. Um, otherwise though, I think generally this is actually in a pretty good shape. Um, there's not any red here, nothing that we need to really figure out. And with governance that sometimes does creep up. So I think we've made really, really good progress in terms of governance for the safe space. We do have a few unresolved issues though for the LHD. Um, and these include variable confidence and acceptance of peer worker led models. And so do we have a general consensus within the community that the peer led model is going to be safe, accessible, it's going to function. I think everybody in this project obviously assumes that it will be, but how do we communicate that? And how do we make sure that everybody who interfaces with the safe space feels equally as so? Um, there is some disappointment with, with limited funding and constraints on the location, staffing, and availability. There are multiple sites in the LHD region and 24 seven avail availability needed. That's a very consistent message. Um, again, across all of the LHDs that I've been working in, um, it is always a consideration around time, the staffing that's available and the location. Those are really, really crucial things. The challenges with the scope that we have for this safe space, at least in the first iteration, and who knows what happens in the future, there is only so much that we have two FTEs, it does need to be in one specific space. And so how do we work within that to make sure we get as much covering as possible and as much support as possible with what we have and work towards something in the future if need be. Uh, a definition of target audience. Um, so some view this as low intensity service, not designed for high risk times. Um, feedback on that in the survey would be really, really great to get a, a really strong consensus on that. Um, and many questions are raised in the feedback loop survey rather than answers. So I think that speaks to the need to communicate with more detail to the community about what is the safe space? Why is it here? What is the, the ministry framework behind that? How are people to be interfacing with this? It's not so much enough to build it and they will come often. We need to really make sure that that message about that safe space is communicated very carefully out to, to the community as it is um, made available. And there was some sense tension of established mental health services uh, with safe space being seen as superior to what's already being delivered um, or should be if LHE constraints were removed. And again, that has come up in other places. Um, I think what's really key is, is to I remember this as an alternative safe space. Um, there are multiple pathways for support for somebody who is in crisis or does need support. And this is one of those. And for a bunch of people, this will work really, really well. But there's always other support services that need to be there, that need to be maintained and will interface as part of this. But I think that does speak to the prior note about the communication. Um, what is this safe space for? Um, who should be accessing it? And why is it available? I think that was all the unresolved issues there, Bron. That's great. Thanks, Will. And look, just a, just one other comment um, to, to put in there, read that whole communication space. Um, there is, uh, every mind has actually been engaged by the New South Wales Ministry of Health to, uh, to lead the comm strategy around the, all of the alternative to EDs in the state. Um, but we have there's a, a large number of people on a on a bit of a working group with every mind to, to contribute to the conversation here and there's definitely it's been raised that individual LHDs will also need the support to be communicating you know nuanced information about their alternative to ED so just so that everyone is aware that that work is being done which is which is great so Carrie I'll hand over to you now to go through um, the scenarios from the joint co-design session Thanks, Bronnie. So we just had this final joint co-design session where we brought all of the lived experience participants or as many as we could have online. So generally we would bring all of the lived experience participants and all the health professional participants. One of the um, limitations of, of um, doing co-design online is that we have um, can only have a limited number of people in that joint session. But I have to say it was a, a really productive session um, and people it was where you could see in the room that there was a really was some um, agreement and a real sort of shared commitment to the values and principles of um, the local safe space model so it was fantastic actually to, to see that and I'll just take you through now how we um, sort of worked through 
some of I guess some of the um, areas that still needed to be explored or or really just kind of bedded down a bit more is that we gave the group um, three different scenarios to work through and by doing that it really sort of pulls focus on when the rubber meets the road in a safe space and those sort of sticky tricky situations that we know happen um, and where say perhaps ethical dilemmas could arise how does how does the safe space um, stay true to those values and principles to stay true to those guiding principles and ways of working that were already um, uh, already came out of the co-design session that the ministry had last year with people and that are um, reflected in those requirement documents and also reflected in the values and principles that you've seen that have come out that have been generated by people with lived experience locally. Thanks, Bronnie. So the, the first scenario was Chantelle is a 17 year old teenage girl who arrives at the safe space experiencing suicidal thoughts. It's the first time she's ever reached out for help and she's frightened by what she's experiencing. She doesn't know where else to go. It's 8 p.m., just 30 minutes before closing time. So you can probably see that the sort of the, the rationale for this scenario in terms of what it's trying to draw out is that um, safe spaces, while they have a no wrong door approach, uh, generally there is um, the, the criteria of them being 18 plus. Um, and then also, so how does the safe space manage um, to support someone under 18 and then also given those constraints that it can't be even though people really want in an ideal world for it to be a 24 7 proposition what happens when someone comes close to closing time for the safe space and Bronnie thanks I'll just take through so um, some of the some of the suggestions for um, by the group about how to manage um, and respond to that kind of scenario um, once the safe space is implemented. So welcome Ch Chantelle and find out what brings her to the safe space. Find if Chantelle, find out if Chantelle has an existing supporter. So family, friends to connect with. So to really actually to harness those natural supports. Um, flexibility, that the safe space needs some flexibility to stay open while someone needs support. Someone like Chantelle is there um, and until a plan, not meaning a safety plan so much in a formal sense, but a plan for her to be able to um, be safe and um, supported um, once the, the safe space closes for the evening. Also um, to just acknowledge that the, the, to Chantel the strength in the fact that she's um, reaching out and to, to um, really reward as someone said um, uh, and acknowledge the fact that she is help seeking. Um, and then also the idea that you just need to take that time that in 10 to 15 minutes in those short windows it's really important to find those little points of connection the things that you supporting Chantel herself to reflect on and and find her own kind of solutions and and and, and to draw up tap into her own strengths so that idea of building rapport and how that is possible with skilled peer workers to do that also that there is um there's a need to be connected with youth services and and perhaps other evening activities so that really spoke to the fact that people talked about the fact that this is nested within a community and and to be able to have those links and some practical wisdom on the ground um, of peer workers that have up-to-date information about what services are available and good working relationships and partnerships with with other community organizations um, and also um, known enough about uh, the young person so follow-up can be provided next the next day so just in, again, just trying to get enough information there so there can be some meaningful kind of follow up. And also just to invite in the spirit of this no wrong door approach, while it technically is a, a space that is available um, to people 18 and above, but to invite Ch Chantel to come back and drop in to see a peer worker again. So just taking that kind of generous approach with whoever rocks up to the safe space. Thanks, Bronnie. Uh, scenario two is that Leanne walks into the safe space and says hi to the peer worker who greets her. She knows the safe space well, having visited for a few weeks in a row. She says it's a place where she can relax for a while, knowing that she's safe from self-harming while she's here and it helps her get through the week. Tonight, she asks if there's anything different she can do while she's at the safe space. And I guess the broad purpose of this was to really to, to draw out from participants about um, what the what the purpose of the of the safe space is in terms of what it provides for people. So perhaps, um, and also to think about the fact that there will be 
return guests, people that will um, seek out the safe space quite regularly, as opposed to just going when they're in an, in an acute crisis. And so what, uh, how does it accommodate those sorts of people? Thanks, Bronnie. And so some of the suggestions were, um, the responses were the physical space and layout should offer variety. And this came up actually um, in another um, context as well. It's, it sort of was a, a, a theme that emerged around the idea of flexibility in the space. So physically, a private space, if she wants a quiet, if she wants quiet, a bigger space to chill out and see others, an outdoor area as well. Um, also that there should be a mix of activities available and supports for someone like Leanne to connect based on her needs and wants. So it's very much about that principle of self-determination. Um, uh, for example, relational support, purposeful activities, distraction activities and practical supports. Also, there was an emphasis that what's important is to explore with Leanne the things she'd like to do. So again, that idea that these things, that this space is really about holding to the value and principles of, of self-determination. Um, to also just an acknowledgement, so that thing of really reflecting in a strength-based way that Leanne is getting value out of the space and she feels safe and that that is a strength in itself. Um, and um, again, for peer work workers to just talk to her about what she needs and how that may change over time. So recognizing that um, Leanne may have come to the safe space initially um, for a particular purpose in an acute kind of situation, but over time that her needs will change and being able to build that rapport and then having that, those ongoing conversations and connections. Um, also just to find out if there's things to connect Leanne with outside of the space, safe space. So like I said to before that, that it was really emphasized that it's important that the safe space has those meaningful partnerships, informal and formal kind of um, relationships that community based services do have with other community organizations. And also for the peer workers to convey the message that it's, it's not only okay, but indeed it's really good that Leanne's coming here when she needs it. So taking that very strength-based approach to, to Leanne um, there. Thanks, Bronnie. And then this is the third scenario. So Amanda is a 20 year old woman with a history of past suicide attempts who comes to the safe space extremely distressed. She says that her life is not worth living, that she's tried everything to stop feeling this way. She tells the SP peer worker that she has been on dozens of different medications, tried therapy for childhood trauma, done everything the psychologist told her and she says nothing ever works and she has run out of options. When the worker asks her if she has plans to kill herself, she tells them that she has bought medication off the internet and is just waiting for her mum and dad to leave her alone so she can take it. The history of previous attempts is known to one of the safe space peer workers who had previously supported her in ED. And I think it's quite clear that what we're trying to to, to draw out there is the way in which um, while there's been broad agreement about the safe space, uh, a commitment to, to the non-clinical um, principle that um, the ministry requires here of a non-clinical service, that, that really this starts to test the limits of people's um, uh, approach to, to, to a non-clinical service, to what support it should provide. And particularly that idea of how how um, robust is the principle of risk tolerance that um, the safe space needs to be held to? Thanks, Bronnie. And so what you can see through the responses um, was that people talked about, and it was a, just a very, very rich conversation, this one, I have to say. And really people came up with some really, really, um, you know, really, really sort of bold vision for how this will work and to, to, to hold the safe space to those values and principles and really demonstrated the, all of the participants how important it is for the safe space to, to um, respond to even the sort of what would be characterised as high, high risk situations with the, with the same kind of compassionate, non-clinical, trauma-informed approach that um, they that people see locally is important for, for holding to every situation. So acknowledging that suicidal intensity can come in waves. So letting those letting that happen over time to understand that it's often for people very fluctuating and letting that sort of breathe and just being present, as someone said with it, having someone to sit, yes, and be present to those high levels of distress um, as well. And sort of to bear witness, as someone said, to those waves. 
um, without trying to rescue the person. Also that it was noted that it's important that workers can, can tolerate their own distress and be comfortable with that. So that was a thought it was a really interesting perspective that someone that a professional brought about the fact that it's not being able to just tolerate someone else's distress, but also to sit comfortably with your own um, and to allow people to say what they need and have a private space to do that. So related to that was the idea of someone with lived experience talked about the need to get out big feelings and not be risk managed um, or for those feelings to be pathologized, particularly people that talked about having a diagnosis and being seen through that lens and, and their experiences and the way that they dealt with them um, and the way they express them as being pathologized, as being seen as a set of symptoms to be risk managed. But this idea that people often, if they act, people can appreciate strong emotions, that people will be able to sort through those themselves. Um, and, and just saying that all of this sort of approach will build trust and rapport with the person when they know that people can hold that space for them. Um, also to harness existing connection to the known person in the space and use it as a strength. So someone um, pointed out that in the scenario, the important thing, and it's often missed, is the fact that um, part of the scenario says that one of the peer workers had previously supported this person through ED. So, so being able to tap into prior connections there um, and, and harness them. And also to acknowledge and recognise that these waves have happened and observed a change. So again, taking that sort of strengths approach to someone and recognizing the way in which they've been able to, they've had the capacity to move th through those things. Thanks, Bronnie. Thanks so much, Carrie. All right, so then the last thing that we did with the uh, members of the combined session was to uh, break into three small uh, groups and ask them to come up with their top five non-negotiables and then we pulled everybody together again so the first one there is that just first impressions mean everything so not negotiable is the fact that this safe space is homely it's welcoming it's a non-clinical environment it tells people that they're important they're comforted they're welcome um, that you're able to keep your belongings safe so it speaks to that um, allowing people to stay in control um, of what's happening um, around them and just for them to know that their belongings are safe somewhere means that that's one thing they don't need to be worrying about. Um, involvement of the person's family on their wishes and family, significant others, carers, whatever it actually is for that person. Assistance to organise their life arrangement. So people spoke about um, the need for the safe space to be able to accommodate if somebody turns up and they've got two young children with them or a baby with them that they've They've come because they need to come to be safe and they didn't want to leave them behind. Or pets, you know, do pets need to be fed or whatever? So just being able to organise um, that type of support. Practicalities in terms of food, tea, coffee, a change of clothes, a bathroom, place to have a shower. Activities for distraction um, with connection to activities out in the community. I love the terms where people talked about having activities for distraction and activities for purpose depending on what somebody was actually looking for at that particular time. Keeping all people safe um, was a non-negotiable, including staff, so physically and psychologically for guests and staff alike. The quality of the staff, um, particularly in genuinely understanding trauma. The flexibility and um, variety of types of spaces within the broader safe space. So having, uh, as um, was mentioned just before, you know, being able to have a space where you can just be quiet if that's what you need and even sit by yourself. Um, but then at other times, spaces where you can mix with other guests or um, have conversations with a couple of, of people or a peer worker inside and outside. So just that flexibility. Uh, location off hospital grounds, ideally a home and away from um, Penrith with existing services. Uh, and important relationships with the suicide prevention outreach team for connection, continuity and follow-up. So they were the nominated non-negotiables that came out of the combined session. So I know that's an enormous amount of information for you. Um, it will be available on the landing page that you've all received in emails in the past where all the information is for this co-design process. The online survey for this Feedback Loop 3 is available now uh, and it's closing on the 16th of November. 
Um, the feedback from this webinar and the survey will be gathered over the coming week and then it will be collated with all previously captured co-design outputs. That then moves into an informed service model development. There'll be finalisation of the governance model, the location and staff recruitment. Um, guardianship role by Roses in the Ocean, um, just to support that transfer of what um, has come from co-design into the service model, into the actual service delivery. So we'll work with the LHD and support them in that process. And then uh, we've been uh, requested to come back for a redesign workshop three to six months after opening. And that gives everyone here who's been involved in the process, as well as people who have been guests at the safe space, at the alternative to ED, um, gives them an opportunity to really come back and feedback what's working, what can we do better, um, other ideas that people will have. So it's that iterative, iterative um, design, which is so important in, in all aspects of this work. All right, so they are next steps. Um, I really want to just do a, a big thank you to everyone within the Nepean Blue Mountains community who've contributed throughout the co-design sessions and the feedback loop surveys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, your voices are central to what happens in this process um, and just so important for, for your um, voices to be heard. So thank you so much for the engagement that you have um, provided throughout the process. Thank you so much to the lived experience of suicide participants and to the health professional participants. Um, you do give up uh, quite a number of hours of your time to contribute to this process and we're very grateful for that. Thanks also to the LHD team and also to New South Wales Ministry of Health for making it or enabling it to happen. So um, I'll just stop sharing now, come back very briefly to screen. Um, so thank you from my perspective to Carrie and, and Will. Um, it's been wonderful working with all the people in the PM Blue Mountains. Mm -hmm. I know from my sake and, and the others, it's been a really enjoyable process and um, we look forward to receiving your feedback from this final survey. Carrie and Will, any final words? Oh, yes, I, I have to say it's been just, I mean, uh, an absolute pleasure to, to listen to people in these local communities and the people that directly participated in this co-design process, just the, I guess, the depth of insight that they brought to their experiences. It's very much appreciated and it really, really, you can see already is going to, really enrich um, the local model. So yeah, we, we really do appreciate it. Yeah, and, and likewise, as, as Bronwyn and uh, Carrie have said, just thanks. You know, if I could go back in time and talk to my younger self, a 12 year old who was going through crisis and distress to say that this project would be happening in the future, you know, what that would mean, I, I, I can't even express. So each of you that have participated in this project so far, you volunteered to do so because you wanted to make things better with your experiences. And that is, that really matters. Um, so for me, it, it's been an, an amazing project to be a part of, but also just really heartwarming and um, inspiring. So thank you. All right. Well, everybody take care. Um, please share that survey far and wide. The more people that respond to this one, the better as well. Um, so that final opportunity to have a have a, a say at this point in the process. So um, take care, have a lovely afternoon and we'll um, hopefully catch up with you soon.